Now in this video we're going to review two things. The first part of the video will cover a blood slide, a single blood smear, and we're going to go over where best to look for Borrelia for spirochetes and similar organisms. In the second part I will show you my microscope. Now let's get started. Uh, here we see video of clumped red blood cells. Not the best location to look for spirochetes. We need to find an area that has more blood plasma so we can see them coming out. Otherwise they get covered and it's difficult to see them. Now let's say you perform the blood smear from left to right. You put a drop of blood on the glass slide and you swiped it from left to right. You will see a large aggregate of cells more towards the left side somewhere in the middle of the slide it'll be somewhere between and towards the right you'll have a wider dispersion of cells now here in the middle of the slide this represents a better viewing area here the grayish bluish area which represents your blood plasma this is where you'll see the organisms come out now here we see a decent amount of blood plasma but there's also a considerable amount of red blood stacking or Brulot. now Brulot is something that i see in pretty much everyone's blood and sometimes that all depends on how you smear it. Sometimes you get a little bit more wet smear or a little drier smear, and you'll see more or less more low. But I do typically tend to see less of it in younger persons' blood than older individuals. And regardless of whether they have a chronic illness or Lyme, I still see it in pretty much everyone's blood. Now let us push forward in our continuation for the ideal spot. Now in areas such as this and this one here, there's... Um, good amount of blood plasma, there's also stacking. You can make observations here, you, you may or may not see them. Um, if they do come out of red blood cells, they may be hidden, they may be underneath or too close to the cell, it might be difficult if we're looking for the best or the most ideal conditions. Um, that's not to say that you won't find them, you, know, you will, um, but there are areas that are better than others. Now here's a better area, and right here, this is ideal. Here you have, overall, you have a good dispersion of red blood cells, there's not a whole lot of stacking, and there's a good amount of plasma in between. And it's great to have uh, plasma in between each cell, this way you can see what's going on. In the beginning you'll be content with just seeing you know, the spirochetes of various organisms, but right uh, long term, you're going to want proof, you're going to want to see them coming out of the red blood cells, you're going to want to see them morphing from one form to the other. It won't be enough just to see them because eventually, if you do become experts in this, you'll see them everywhere in, in those that are chronically sick, and you're going to want to hunt for proof. Now, all the white blood cells that we've seen so far are pretty much colorless. They're grayscale, black and white. And the red blood cells, they're reddish, pinkish color. Now, why is that? Well, red blood cells contain hemoglobin. Their hemoglobin is used to transport oxygen from your lungs to the rest of your body. And hemoglobin contains four molecules of iron. When oxygen binds to the iron, it has a reddish appearance. So, why mention this? Well, it is important to determine what is of human cellular origin versus bacterial. Sometimes they're not easily distinguishable, and you can mistake one for the other, and vice versa. Now, there are two phenomena which can cause red blood cells to become oddly or aberrantly shaped. Uh, one of them is called ghosting. Now, in ghosting, what happens is, and don't forget, I mean, we're, we're exuding blood from our fingers, we're causing trauma, we're smearing it, causing further trauma. So you'll have conditions where this will happen. Now in ghosting what happens is the hemoglobin, the intercellular content of the red blood cell, gets pushed out, gets released. And the end result you'll have spectrin, which is a cytoskeletal protein on the intracellular side of the plasma membrane. It helps maintain the scaffolding in the structure of the cell. So we can get a condition of ghosting where it expels the internal contents, the hemoglobin, and what you have is just the scaffold in the outer cell wall. And in this respect, it'll, it'll once it releases the hemoglobin, it'll be appear colorless, and hence the, uh, the term ghost. Now, it's important to know that some of the cells will not completely ghost. They'll only expel part of the cons. 
and appear semi-transparent or semi-colorless. It's also important to note that cells can shrink as well. So sometimes you'll get very small ghosted or partially ghosted cells, other times you'll get larger cells. So why is this important to know? Well, medium to large size ghosted red blood cells can appear as candida in blood smears at times. And the smaller ghosted white blood, sometimes they can get pretty darn small, as small as uh, a micron in, in length. They can appear as Borrelia cysts. So it's hard to distinguish one from the other at uh, you know, that scale. Now let's discuss the other phenomenon that occurs in red blood cells. It's called prenation. The human body temperature on average is about 98.6 degrees. And once you expose human blood to the atmosphere, you're going to unavoidably get water evaporation. And in so doing, you create a hypertonic condition of the blood. The water concentration on the blood plasma, the great clearish area that you see in the video, will be less and there'll be more water trapped within the red blood cells. Now from high school you'll know that solubles in water move from an area of greater concentration to a lower concentration. At one point that force is going to be too big and water is going to come rushing out of the red blood cell along with some solubles and in this respect it'll create this crenation or this pointy prickly studded and dotted look of the red blood cells. Now take a look at these next few video scenes. They were taken at the edge of the slip cover. Do you notice more crenation and more ghosting? Along the edges of the slip cover, you would have given it more time, more exposure to the environment, and more water evaporation and this gradient of difference in concentrations. As a result, you'll get more aberrations, more cell misconfigurations. Now, I've seen a website refer to these crenated cells as being pathologically infected with mycoplasma pneumoniae. And I don't think that's the case because I've seen various people's blood and this is through and through. I've seen it in everyone's blood from young to small to old. And this just happens over time with red blood cells. Uh, so I don't think that to be true. Otherwise, we would all be in trouble. Also, is it possible to have a combination of crenated and ghosted or partially ghosted cells? I think it is. And that's best exemplified in a crenated red blood cell that appears black and white. It feels colorless because it's lost its hemoglobin. Uh, and there's combinations of all these throughout the blood smear and through time. Over time, they can become one or the other. So why is it that if we look at a particular location slide, let's say the edge of the slip cover, we can see such variation in these cells? Well, take for instance, if you have one single red blood cell, you have 10 surrounding blood cells. The 10 surrounding one, let's just say they go through creation and they expel, expel their water contents, part of their internal contents. Then that center one is going to be exposed to a greater concentration of water at any one given time, causing it to inflate or become ghostly. It appears evident to me that ghosted cells, on average, when they are large, they appear much larger than crenated cells, which appear shrunken. So I think the reverse of hypertonic condition, high Potonic can cause this, where you have greater concentrations of water in the plasma and it rushes in, filling up and bulking up the cell. Now I've shown you a progression of sizes of these crenated ghosted red blood cells to the point where they're so small they can be confused and misinterpreted as being spirochetal or Borrelia cyst. Now I don't think. This one we're viewing right now is a cyst. I think more likely it is the type of red blood cell we've been discussing. Now the bottom arrow. Is that a spirochetal cyst or is that a shrunken red blood cell? I think because of the jagged edge is more likely 
get us a red blood sign from the evidence that we've seen in the various videos. Although, I mean, it fits just about the size of what you would expect a Borrelia spirochetal cyst to be. In the top arrow, is that a bleb or part of a red blood cell? Anything that's, you know, one micron or less can be one of the two. It could either be also a platelet or any of the lipid droplets that get dissolved uh, through digestion. The other objects that can be seen in a blood smear are lysed white blood cells. And they contain particles called lysosomes, which are basically packets of enzymes that digest bacteria, viruses, and foreign particles. Once they break open, they release these lysosomes and their internal content, and they can also uh, be mistaken for either cyst and or uh, blebs. They also have this Brownian motion movement once they're released. Uh, at times they'll be stagnant, other times you'll see they'll have quite a bit of movement in a field of moving particles around the uh, broken or uh, disrupted uh, cell. Hello YouTubers and Lime Warriors. Today I'm just going to be discussing and reviewing my microscope and my microscopy equipment. I use the Zeiss, Carl Zeiss standard laboratory microscope. There's nothing special or expensive about it. I actually bought two of them for 200 bucks on eBay. Uh, this is a trinocular. I originally it was a binocular. I replaced the head with a trinocular. This allows me to place the uh, Amscope 9 megapixel USB camera on here and it goes right on the 23 millimeter eyepiece. And um, the halogen bulb on here broke at one point. I called in for a replacement. They had sent me the wrong one. And since then I've been using a lamp with a with an LED bulb on there. And I have it all wrapped in aluminum foil to get maximum reflection back into where I need it. Uh, the bulb I use I got I purchased from uh, Home Depot. It's a Cree uh, daylight 60 watt LED. Um, when I first came out, it was about fifteen, sixteen dollars. A few months later, thirteen dollars, and right now it could be had for about eleven dollars. So eleven dollars and a and a standard lamp, and that's pretty much it. I mean, there's nothing extravagant about this setup, and uh, you can even view the spirochetes with less exotic setups. It's not such a big deal, and it's not um, something that you can't do. I mean, everybody can can do this really. You can always go to your local university or high schools. They may have microscopes. You can borrow use theirs, have your blood set up and go there and view it. Um, you could also ask anybody who may have one or purchase one yourself like, like I did. Uh, any questions just uh, let me know. I hope this video helps. Thanks for watching.